it's my pleasure to introduce to you someone who I'm sure you already know, Tanya Wood, the Executive Director of the CHS Alliance. Tanya. Thank you, Paul. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's fantastic to see so many of you here, friends from around the globe. Thank you. My name, as Paul said, Tanya Wood. I'm the director of the CHS Alliance. And here in a pretty cold and blustery Geneva, as opposed to Nairobi, where we'd originally intended to be for the launch of the Humanitarian Accountability Report 2020. This report owes its roots to CHS Alliance's predecessor, the Humanitarian Accountability Project. The CHS Alliance has continued producing these reports every two years with the intention to provide an overview as well as differing and sometimes challenging viewpoints on the state of accountability in the sector. It's been more than five years since the launch of the core humanitarian standard for quality and accountability. And this version is the first time the report has been based on data from organizations that have conducted one of the three forms of CHS verification. I'm incredibly heartened to reiterate an announcement Robert Swetman made in the opening session earlier, that as of today, we have 108 organizations who've put themselves through one of these verification processes. Every one of these organizations, and many of you are represented on the line with us today, can attest to the rigor of scrutinizing your organization to see how well they measure up to the nine commitments that we made at the end of 2014 to men, women, girls and boys affected by crisis. But also importantly, and this is really critical to the discussion over the next few days, how they've also made the necessary improvements to be able to live up to that standard. You'll hear from some of these members soon in a short film. But before we do, I just wanna say a personal huge thank you for joining us today, especially when we know there's so much going on at the moment for everybody right now. The Alliance really is a collective movement for change and I think we can all agree that change is very much still needed. In order to change, we need to be able to exchange views, listen to different perspectives and challenge each other on ideas. And this is one of the opportunities with this CHX exchange to do just this. So please allow me to encourage, cajole, maybe beg, for you to share your ideas either on the chat function here in the Zoom or on the main exchange platform. We may not be able to address everything today or over the next two days, but whatever you share with us, it's gonna be extremely valuable in the work ahead. I'm gonna be talking to you again soon, but for now, let's hear some of the different perspectives from across the sector. Thank you, Rob. Thanks very much, Tanya. We come together to ensure that um, the agency, the protection, the dignity and respect of the people that we serve is put first and center at all the work that we do. What CHS has been able to do is to allow us to define what good looks like. Most of the humanitarian organizations, they are following complete response mechanism. Another one biggest achievement, the uh, integration of participation and communication and feedback from the affected people. CHS, among other things, 
have contributed to put uh, prevention and protection against sexual exploitation and abuse very much on the humanitarian agenda. But we would say localization has been the biggest achievement and how it's become a strong advocate, a strong voice for localization. Sometimes we work with community groups that are not necessarily structured in the same way as the big NGOs. It's really important that we ensure consistency in our approach without making it really difficult for them to be able to be part of the core humanitarian standards. Remain focused for people in need. And that is what CHS is doing. It's helping us to put the focus back on the people in need. It is also important to bring donors on board so that they also see the importance of CHS and uh, as a tool to improve the sector. Making the community the center of our, of our universe, the people, the communities, and make them our heart of our mission. Sangat penting bagi saya untuk percaya dengan sistem. Pendapat saya sangat penting. Thanks, Tanya, and thanks, Rob. That's a fantastic lead-in to our first panel this afternoon on how far have we come? And we're going to meet some people who were there right at the beginning, individually present in Copenhagen back in December 2014. And they are Kate Half of the ICRC, Manu Gupta from Seeds India, Millie Dolner Felstead from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Denmark, and Gui Yop Son from UN Ocha. I'm going to go to them in that order and ask them, what brought you to the CHS launch? And how did you feel on that day? Kate, just start us off. Thank you very much. It makes me feel like a dinosaur sort of there at the launch, but no, it was a great moment. I was there at the time I was working for the uh, Steering Committee for Humanitarian Response, SCHR, which had been quite instrumental in um, supporting the three organizations involved initially in, um, in the work um, around the CHS, which resulted eventually in the work um, in the development of the, of the CHS. Um, so I was quite involved in that. In parallel, uh, SCHR had been working on looking at um, whether or not uh, certification, third party certification for the humanitarian sector could add value in terms of promoting quality and accountability. So it was very, very exciting to be there at the launch of the CHS, which I really believed um, has a transformational power effectively. Um, so really promoting the whole Verif verification, verifiability of the standard as part of what I was promoting. I think I'll stop here, but very happy to go more in details as we go along. Thanks, Kate. We'll come back for more details in a couple of minutes. I'd like to know, Manu, how were you feeling that day? What brought you there? Well, well first of all, uh, a huge congratulations to the entire CHS team for having reached this milestone. I mean, uh, of course, one feels very nostalgic, uh, uh, you know, uh, having been part of this journey ever since it got launched. And in fact, a uh, little before that, because I was part of the HAP uh, board at that point of time when we had a lot of uh, deliberations and frictions and fires, if you like, uh, around, you know, getting together something which was considered uh, almost uh, non-doable and and I'm glad we could put together a framework that has lived its first five formative years with itself is a testimony of the fact that uh, it 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 
uh, really carried that uh, depth and credibility that we always aspired for. Uh, I think the, ex uh, as I recollect those, uh, that wonderful day um, in Denmark when it got launched, uh, uh, we, it was actually a culmination of an achievement at two levels. Um, one was that it led, it, it led to a creation of a much more democratic space that allowed participation of actors, uh, both international and local. And I think that was a, a huge departure from the processes that were in place up until then. And, uh, and the space that got defined was uh, very democratic in some sense and, and, and allowed us in some way recognize the importance of coordinating and complementing the role of the local actors. I think that was one great excitement that I had and, and, and that excitement, by the way, continues. Uh, the second was, uh, I think we were at that uh, very important point in the history of humanitarian action, where we were, uh, of course, the WHS was coming up, which was a big, first big event uh, in few months hence. But also, uh, I think uh, as, as humanity, we were facing a never before challenge, um, maybe, a biggest challenge after the World War II. And in that uh, kind of a, you know, a, a demand for, you know, of uh, quality and accountability from a whole range of actors, uh, you know, the existing institutional structure was, in my opinion, not able to cater to the wide diversity of actors and their contextual um, needs. And I think CHS uh, provided that kind of an enabling uh, framework and, and you know, uh, aspects of coordination which, about which I think I'll speak about a little later um, were, were something that allowed not just organizations, but organizations working with each other to perform better and to be mutually accountable as much as they are accountable to the affected communities. Paul? Thanks, Manu. Let's go over to Denmark. Mille, what do you remember from the day and um, from that occasion? Yeah, no, I surely remember that day in Copenhagen uh, six years ago uh, where we launched the CHS. And I also remember the sensation in the room I was both happy but also relieved. Uh, there was this, this sensation of, of relief uh, because the process around agreeing and also negotiating the CHS had been uh, very uh, democratic and inclusive and transparent and also lengthy. So I think uh, we were all happy that we had come that far and that we had agreed upon this standard. Um, and, and I also personally was really happy to see how much support that uh, the standard got already at that time. Um, I think that the overall all the hope was that by agreeing upon the CHS, that we would also be able to raise the, the overall bar or the, the standard for the humanitarian sector, with the focus of increasing um, the level of accountability and quality assurance. And from, um, from the Danish point of view, we were quite ambitious already at that time. So we were ready to commit to the CHS, to adhere to it, but, uh, and also to make it a requirement for all our humanitarian Danish uh, NGO partners uh, to live up to the CHS, but also to uh, be verified or certified against the standard, which is why we also supported the, the, the establishment of HCI, um, which came out of the SCHR's uh, certification project. Uh, project. Um, so I think that was, it's very exciting. And I know we'll be talking about that later to see what actually then came out of it. But that was our expectation at the time. That's great, thanks very much. Guisson, your memories and aspirations from that time. So thank you uh, very much for having me in this forum. Uh, <clears throat> uh, back then, I was the director of OCHA in New York, um, uh, overseeing uh, the prep work 
uh, for the uh, World Humanitarian Summit. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, buzz, uh, excitement, uh, you know, with the hope that uh, we will be able to change the culture of the humanitarian system uh, by focusing a lot more on being accountable to the affected population. Uh, and I don't know if you recall that there was a lot of discussion about how we can make the humanitarian system much more effective. Uh, and there was even a report that came out uh, 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 describing how we can assess and measure uh, humanitarian effectiveness. Uh, and also there was a lot of, uh, uh, in my view, uh, dizziness. And the dizziness comes from the uh, rapidly changing technology. And with that, how we are going to leverage uh, the information and data in such a way that we can have much more evidence-based information, uh, which will able to uh, measure our performance, uh, but also uh, make sure that we are indeed uh, responsive to the affected people. So at the time, uh, I think the aspirations, uh, as I recall, were three things from my perspective. One was the desire and uh, inspiration and aspiration to change the culture of the whole humanitarian system. Uh, it's about uh, changing the behavior of both responders uh, as well as the donors. So if we are talking about humanitarian financing, how do we actually ensure that the uh, funding is on your marks, multi-year uh, and much more flexible in such a way uh, that it enables organizations to respond timely uh, with the needs uh, that people require. Uh, and then the second uh, uh, hope actually was to uh, walk in the talk on dignity. I mean, we talk a lot about humanity, which is one of the key principles of the humanitarian uh, work that we do, but the dignity is something that we don't talk about. And as a part of that, there was a lot of uh, discussion uh, of uh, operationalizing the humanitarian development nexus and peace building, which was a decade old uh, agenda that we have been working on. And yet, not being able to be really successful, not really understanding what it means to uh, respect the dignity of the affected people so that people do not necessarily want to receive handouts, but that they want to be much more self-sufficient uh, and they want to be self-reliant. So I think there was also kind of the, the agenda for humanity was all about making sure that we are able to link uh, with the sustainable development goals. And finally, it was actually uh, making the whole humanitarian system uh, fit for purpose. Uh, so it's about leveraging the rapidly evolving uh, technology and the partnerships, recognizing that one cannot do everything. It's a uh, true partnership, working in coordination and collaborative fashion. We can only make changes together in such a way that uh, we can not only save lives, but also livelihoods. Over to you. Thank you very much, Grison. As some of you will have seen in the chat, Tanya's invited questions. We've only got a few more minutes with this panel, but um, I'm going to start with one of the questions that has been put into the chat from Andrew Paris of Medair. So he's asking to each of the panelists, what has been the one thing that surprised you the most in these five years since 2014 about how the CHS has been adopted and applied? So your one biggest surprise. Come, come back to you, Kate. I'm not sure I can talk about a surprise. Uh, I think what I'm seeing in the five years since the creation of the CSS of the CHS, and I would really insist on its verification scheme, including the the possibility to carry out a third party independent uh, verification or certification, is really very much a journey towards more and more adoption of the the process and the vision. And as I said earlier, for me, it's a transformative journey because it's aiming at really promoting enabling two-way equal equitable engagement between organizations delivering assistance and people affected by crisis it's about equalizing the playing field going back to what manu gupta called democratization earlier for me it's very much in line with the localization agenda it's effectively the possibility of demonstrating that a small local organization can be on the same footing as a big international organization and it's really to serve as a common reference for the whole sector so while i'm seeing a lot of progress in the adoption the comprehension the vision of this i think one of the uh, ladies in the in the video talked about it's about what is good humanitarian assistance I think 
I think we, we're getting there, but I think there's still a long way to go to have it as the common reference for the humanitarian sector. So for me, what's fantastic is that it has taken off. It's fantastic to hear uh, Tanya talk about 108 organizations which have been verified against the CHS uh, since, um, since inception, the, since the launch of the CHS. So for me, that's really fantastic. But I really think it's important that we insist on the fact that there's still a way to go. And I'm really interested in the approach taken by the, by the report, by the HAR around actually what does it take to really make that change? Because we're on the journey, but we're not quite there yet. That's great, thanks Kate. Manu, have you had a surprise uh, along the way? Well, um, uh, for me, I think uh, the, the, the unique uh, uh, point around CHS and this is what we've been able to uh, bring out and the, uh, from a user perspective is that uh, the standards unlike many others has been um, flexible enough to fit for purpose as uh, you know uh, some of the previous speakers have spoken and for that uh, you know, it has really enabled uh, organizations such as the one I represent, SEEDS, to be able to uh, bring about inward change in the way we, uh, you know, organize our programs, uh, bring our staff up to speed um, you know, with, with these standards. And also, uh, I think most uniquely, how do we engage with uh, with affected communities, with other stakeholders at local level? And and you know, as I said earlier, it uh, it provides for a system level accountability, which uh, I think is uh, is really its USP. Thank you, Miller. Surprise. Yeah, I'm surprised by the surprise question, um, but I but I think uh -huh. that. Um, I think actually maybe it's more what we couldn't expect, but maybe what have been the contribution of, of what is positive, I think, at this stage is that the CHS um, seemed in, in the beginning to be quite simple. I mean, if you at least if you read this the, the, the simple version of it, then it's very difficult to, to not agree upon these quality criteria. Uh, but when it comes down to it, it's hard work. And it takes continuous learning. Um, and also, I think that's some of the value that comes with it, that we have had this common platform of communication, this shared language, this ability to, to improve and also recognize that learning and improvement is, is imperative at, at all times in order to, to do the best we can. Um, and, and, and of course, also what, what we hear from the partners that we've been working with that had actually integrated CHS uh, and verified that process is that, that they have learned that their approach to humanitarian action has been more people-centered. That, that, and I think we, you were also mentioning in that, that it's a, it's a matter of culture, it's a matter of mentality and approach. So, so, so yes, it's, it's hard work, but it's also a good way of, of making sure that we are on the same, same page. Um, and, and then, um, yeah. And I think it's also why we think it is so important that we don't not only talk about the CHS, but that we also are willing to, to actually document and verify how we work with the standard and how we're willing to continuously improve. That's well, certainly going to be a theme of the next couple of days. So uh, we can look forward to some in-depth discussions on that. Guisson, what was a bit surprising for you along the way over those five years? Uh, I'm not so sure about a surprise, uh, but I think, uh, uh, okay, well, maybe pleasant surprise and maybe yeah. uh, not so pleasant surprise. Uh, the pleasant surprise is that the coordination system as a whole has improved uh, tremendously. I think uh, I have seen it uh, uh, in the field. Uh, uh, I was until very recently the resident humanitarian coordinator in Sudan and during the COVID period, it was very clear how the whole uh, system and the actors came together in a coordinated fashion to respond to the crisis. Um, and uh, it didn't matter who you were. Uh, and uh, of course, it was uh, underpinned by the funding uh, and the incentives, uh, but there was a huge effort uh, to ensure um, uh, that we were not duplicating 
and that was actually based on very clear standards and the commitments. Uh, and so I think that uh, is a good surprise. Now, what so uh, what is uh, not maybe the, the best surprise and uh, surprise that we need to work on uh, is that uh, there are too many still accountability mechanisms which need to be streamlined. So for instance, uh, there is a, a sexual uh, uh, exploitation and abuse uh, mechanism. Uh, there's a feedback mechanism to get the quality uh, uh, feedback from the responders or, or uh, beneficiaries or affected people. So you have, uh, in, even in the same geographical area, you have so many of these different mechanisms which are all uh, are about uh, account, being accountable to the, uh, the people. And you know, talking about people-centric, we want to make sure we uh, make these tools or mechanisms very easy for people, for them to use. Uh, so I think uh, this is an area that we need to work on. So there's a good surprise in terms of leapfrogging uh, to um, uh, make the coordination work so much better, avoiding duplication. On the other hand, we are still quite a long way to go in terms of streamlining some of these key instruments and the tools and the mechanisms. Over to you. Thank you. Yes, I'm sure that there's, there's still work to be done, which we're going to be hearing about. There's a few questions we didn't get to, though you have covered to some extent what these questions are asking. I'll just mention them briefly. There was one about expectations yet to be met. Uh, another one about linkage to grand bargain, the localization question. And a question about the setbacks or failures that we can learn from as we improve accountability to affected people. So we don't have time to answer those now with the four of you, but we've noted them. And if anyone else puts questions in as we go along, they're gonna be picked up by panelists and by organizing teams so that we can find answers either within the next couple of days or take them into future discussions as we need to. So thanks very much to the panel, virtual applause to all of you as well. And do stay with us for, of course, the remaining parts of this session. We're going to go now to find out if we are really making aid work better for people affected by a crisis. So these are in a way the presentation of the report's main findings. And I'm in pleasure, it's my pleasure to welcome Mac Tanya Wood and she's going to be speaking with Paul Knotts Clark to answer some of those questions for us. Tanya and Paul. Thank you, Paul. The two Pauls. Uh, thank you so much to the panelists that we've just heard from. I think it's fantastic to get the perspectives of those who were actually there when this initiative launched. I'm going to now focus, we're going to actually delve into this report and talk a little more about what those findings are and hopefully address some of the questions that you've raised in the chat just now. Uh, next slide, please. So maybe just in terms of context, let me just remind everyone sort of why we need this report. I think um, the panelists that you've just heard from, uh, and I don't think we can reiterate it enough, that as a sector, we've made these nine commitments and we've made them to actual people who've been affected. The intention, and I think Kate alluded to this well, was that if people know better what to expect, they can hold us to account. That's the intention that we made those commitments um, more than five years ago. Importantly, and extremely importantly for us as the CHS Alliance, meaning us and the broader and all the members, is that this can be measured, which means that we can create improvements. We're seeing that figure going up slowly, up to the now 108 organizations verified. And what that starts to give, we can have the debate of whether that's enough organizations, whether it's not enough, but what it starts to give us is an evidence base where we can start to make some analysis, some extrapolations of where as a sector we're moving to. And what this report hopefully does, because it's the first time we've been able to use the verification data, and we hope over the next two years, we'll see an even greater increase in the number of organizations verifying, is it starts to give us the report, enables us to see the progress over time. 
So what does it actually, what will you find in this report? If I can have the next slide. So obviously, I'm sure you've all read the report by now, but just in case you haven't, let me give you a little bit of tell you what you'll find in it. Firstly, it's based on the learning from what was at the beginning of this year, at the beginning of 2020, which this year seems a long year, but we were working with verification data from around 90 organizations. So we were looking at the reports from all those 90 organizations. What we did in terms of the actual data is we broke that 90 organizations down into a smaller subset to look at the ones that had verified between 2018 and 2019 to try and give us a snapshot of progress in that time frame. The next thing it does is what was important for us because we've got this five year time span is to try and look and see at what the progress is that is being made by these organizations and the means that we could most reliably do that was through the organizations who've gone through the most robust uh, verification option open to us, which is the certified organizations by HKI. So we were able to track the progress of the certified organizations. Then thanks to um, our authors and thanks to the analysis and our reviewers, we provided an analysis of what that data is telling us, not only from the data, but we looked at other commentary in the sector. We looked at other reports, such as the state of the humanitarian system. And we also used importantly, data from affected people, particularly thanks to Ground Truth Solutions to give us the perspective and some recommendations for the way forward. And finally, obviously, through looking at each of those nine commitments, what we start to see is some trends. And there's three trends that we start to see recurring throughout. And you'll hear more in a while from Paul Knox Clark, who'll talk to that. If I can have the next slide, please. So what else does the report give us? I don't think I can give enough thanks to those organizations that have put them through this. And I can't stress enough this really rigorous process to be able to measure themselves. And through that, we have some real concrete examples of where, particularly from, again, the certified organizations who had to, by the nature of the certification process, make some real step up, some enormous strides uh, analyzing not only their policies, but particularly how they get those policies systematically pushed through their organization. So they're really having an impact on the ground for the people we're able to serve. And so you get these stories of change throughout the report for each of the commitments. And I just want to say thank you to those organizations for sharing those with us. Next slide, please. And finally, the CHS is obviously based on hearing from people. And so one of the most significant aspects, I think, of the report is the views, diverse views from a range of people uh, representing people who've been recipients of aid. We've heard from two of the other copyright holders of the CHS, international NGOs, governments, UN and uh, no apologies from myself on the gender ratio that you see here from the opinion pieces. Next slide, please. And I would really like to just find, finish um, this introduction to the report, just uh, couldn't go by without saying some thank yous. Um, I'd like to say thank you to the people listed here who gave us invaluable input in some early drafts of the report which enabled us to produce the report that you see today. I obviously want to thank the government donors who help us be able to produce this work. And I want to say thank you to members of the CHS Alliance team who've worked pretty relentlessly through 2020 on this report. A special thank you to Bonaventura, who you saw earlier in the opening session, as well as Rosa Argent. A huge thank you to you both. And now my final thank you, as I'm gonna hand over to one of the authors of the report, Paul Knox Clark, who's gonna take us through what all this means and answer your questions of kind of where we are in 2020 on verifying against the CHS. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Tanya. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. 
Um, as, as Tanya said, uh, my name is Paul. I'm with the, uh, the CHC initiative, the Climate and Humanitarian Crisis Initiative. And it's a real honor to be asked to briefly present some of the findings from the 2020 HAR today. Um, like I think probably many of, many of us here, I've been involved with the, the standard since it was, since really the very beginning, since it was just a twinkle in the eye of, of uh, HAP and uh, Sphere and people in aid. Um, and I like to think of myself, and I, I hope Tanya, you think of me as a, a critical friend of the project uh, with the emphasis on friend. Um, and as such, I've, I've uh, been able to contribute um, to both the 2018 and now the 2020 uh, humanitarian accountability report. Um, so what I'd like to do today is just take a few of your minutes to outline some of the key findings uh, and also to suggest what, what these findings might mean for the system as a whole. Going back to the aim of the report, broadly, what we were trying to do here as a group was to measure five years on how the verified agencies are performing on the commitments, more or less now, and the progress that's been made over time towards uh, around performance on the commitments. So let's look at these two elements, um, current performance first, and then progress uh, second. May we have the next slide, please? So here you see uh, the nine commitments and the progress in the green bars uh, towards those commitments uh, on the right hand side. And the main message I think uh, that you'll take away from that is that there is an awful lot more work to do to meet the commitments. Um, the average aggregated scores for each commitment are with one exception, which we'll come back to in a minute, in the range of two to three. You can see 2.56, 2.46 and so on. Um, now within the CHS, a score between two and three means that overall systematic efforts are being made in the area, but that not all the key points are being addressed. And so the commitment is not being met in all places and at all times. If it is being met at all places and all times, you get a three and you can see um, that there is one area, uh, number six, which is pretty close, but the others are, are not there yet. Now, I'd like to emphasize this as an average figure. Um, by bunching all the organizations together, we have, it does tend to downplay the individual success stories. And it's worth remembering that one third of CHS verified organizations actually met, that is they got a three, um, on three or more of the commitments. Um, what happens when you put all of the information together though, of course, is that these individual um, successes are averaged out um, by organizations that are doing less well on the commitment. So what we have here is the average for the verified organizations. And there's no escaping the fact that those average scores are low. Uh, some of you might say even demoralizing given how long the sector has been working on many of these issues. In, in a way to me they look like very 20th century challenges which we still haven't been able to solve for our sector in the 21st century. I think the scores are also very worrying because of what they say about the system's ability to change. In a world, as we see, that's undergoing massive change, change that will make tens or hundreds of millions of uh, our brothers and sisters more vulnerable. Um, COVID, of course, is an early indicator all of the lights on the humanitarian dashboard are blinking red. The money is going down, climate change, environmental destruction are locking in a future of unprecedented crises. You have that. And then on the other side, you have this slow overall rate of change and improvement, which doesn't suggest that we will be ready to meet these challenges. But the results also suggest that we should be able at ways that we can change more rapidly, going back to, I think, what Kate said earlier, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But for now, if we could just move to the second slide, please. And look at performance, a move from performance now to progress over the last three years. Um, the point here, I think, 
is that we are seeing progress in the organizations that have been certified. Now, let me just, uh, it's quite a busy slide. Let me just clarify a couple of things. First of all, the eagle-eyed among you will have seen that the total scores on this slide are slightly different from the total scores on the last slide. The reason is because, as Tanya uh, explained earlier, they are using two slightly different data sets. This slide uses a subset of the organizations on the previous slide. So that explains the slightly different totals. They're not hugely different, but they are slightly different. Um, what you see here is the red bar is the score three years ago on average, the uh, gray two and the yellow one. And we do see even in these aggregated figures that there has been positive change to a limited degree, particularly if you look at three local capacity four communication participation and feedback and commitment five uh, welcomes and addresses complaints. In all of those areas, we do see meaningful change over the last three years, even when we average the numbers together. Um, and I should underline again that the bunching of averages is at work here too. There are some individual agencies who have made really significant progress in some of these areas. Um, but because the different organizations tend to be putting their efforts into different things, what happens is the needle overall doesn't move as far as perhaps it might. Um, and so what we get is results which are perhaps less than the sum of the energies, less than the sum of the parts that have gone into all the work that certified verified agencies are doing. And we'll come back to that again in a second. But for now, may I have the next slide, please? The third key point is just to note that there are significant differences in performance between commitments and particularly between commitment five and six. Um, what to say about this? I mean, commitment five, I think we all, it's just shocking. Um, Overall, after all of the conferences and policies and guidance, a system that works with some of the most marginalized people on earth is still so far from fully meeting commitment five, uh, welcoming and addressing complaints. And I know that this is gonna be a core focus of um, the, the, the thinking and the action planning over the next couple of days. It is, however, posit positive to remember that that same uh, commitment, Commission 5, was one of the ones where, albeit from a low base, we've seen uh, some of the greatest movement. And so change is possible and change is happening over the past three years. And if we go to Commitment 6, it's also positive to see that coordination, which we know is an area which makes a real contribution to the effectiveness of humanitarian action, a real contribution to saving lives, and which is an area where so much time, money has been spent, is one where we are almost at an acceptable standard. Next slide, please. So what does this tell us about the ability of the humanitarian system, about the humanitarian system and about its ability to change? Uh, well, we could draw quite a lot out of this. Uh, for, I'd like to pull on four points, but I'm sure, sure you will have many others as well. The first, about change being continuous. Change is not a one-off event. We tend to see change as kind of running race with a finish, and when you crest the tape, you know, the change is complete. Um, but in fact, you know, we all know that the internal, external context is constantly changing that new and more difficult situations are arising. And actually the solutions that we work so hard on to make work in one context don't necessarily transfer very well to another, to another time or place. Uh, we also know that the more we find out about difficulties and problems, uh, the more we discover new jobs that need to be done to overcome them. So for all of these reasons, when it comes to humanitarian improvement, I'd suggest the finishing line is always moving further away. And that means that we need to constantly be changing. Change needs to be a continuous process, not a one-off. Because change doesn't stop, if we stop, we'll fall behind. 
And so ongoing attention, ongoing monitoring is going to be required for consistent improvement of humanitarian action. And it's this sort of ongoing monitoring that's provided by the CHS and that could prevent us falling back. The second point, small scale actions lead to change in a way that policy creation on its own just doesn't. Um, one interesting result from this edition of the HA was that the scores on policy development, that is the scores on whether or not agencies had policies were notably better than those scores for people's behaviors, that is whether people were following the policies. And it's really probably about time that we all realized that the system can't just use a policy um, to change, you know, organizations, humanitarian organizations in the system are not machines. And we as people are not cogs or chips who can be updated by a new download of a policy. Um, if we expect change to happen, we need to think about it in a different and more holistic way. Uh, we need to accept there's a limit to what policies can achieve. And particular, we need to look at those places where change is already happening and try and build up from those uh, good examples of change happening in difficult conditions. And one of the lovely things about the HAR here, and I hope we'll hear more about this, um, is that there are great examples um, in the stories of change uh, that can be shared and replicated. The third area, the need for organizational and for systemic change. Um, CHS very much was designed for individual organizations to help individual organizations see what they needed to change and then work on it. And that's really important. It's actually, it's necessary for the changes that we need to see. But in many areas, it's probably not enough on its own. Um, if you think, and we go back to the if you're, issue of complaints mechanisms that was raised a minute ago. For example, if we had a hundred complaints mechanisms in a program, those might actually be less effective than one program wide complaints mechanism. And a systemic approach there, a program approach there may be better than lots of individual approaches. Similarly, either way, uh, in order to, to really capitalize on those complaints mechanisms when it comes to serious abuse, we need systemic structures and mechanisms uh, around employment, as we know, uh, of staff to prevent abusers being uh, easily re-employed. And so to, to complement um, the work that's being done by agencies, we also need to have systemic work done as well. And I think the key here is really identifying where agency by agency work is most effective and where the systemic work to complement the CHS is required. Finally, um, we should focus on the multiplier effect of small issues. And this is the right, the red element to the right of this slide. One really interesting finding um, that I hope you take away from this is that across the nine commitments and the 62 indicators of the CHS, when we looked, there were three areas that consistently came up as blocks to change. They were participation, particularly communication with people affected by crisis, information management, and organizational flexibility. And it's possible that a sustained effort in these three areas would lead to effects across the commitments, um, really open up fast change uh, in these areas. So failure to communicate the basics, the first one, um, it, it so often you know, although quite sophisticated mechanisms for, for, for feedback, for example, were being put in place, we were failing to tell people what they could legitimately expect and what they could do if the, our, our work did not meet their expectations. And that was really slowing down movement in commitments four, five, and nine. Uh, information management. So this was a host of issues related to collection, analysis, use, and storage of information came up again and again and again. Uh, as blocks to improvement. Getting information in time, asking the right questions and getting the right information, using the information that we have and using what we're being told in decision making um, is not easy, but sustained work in these areas 
would have effects on all nine of the commitments because it was a constraint in all nine of the commitments. Um, and organizational flexibility, we found that even where organizations did have the information, they found it very difficult to change their programs for a variety of reasons, skills, logistics, supply chains, uh, rigid funding. Not easy to address, but a concerted um, effort in this area would have you know, demonstrably probably effects in commitments one, two, three, four, five, and nine. So across the board, in sum, um, organizations are doing an awful lot of work and a lot of thinking and a lot of activity to create solutions. Um, there are areas of excellence that we could build on, but real improvements is required. These numbers aren't good enough. Change has been much too slow. Um, and the approaches that we have used to change up until now are not up to the task. The report suggests how changes can be achieved to finally address issues that have been on our agenda since the 1980s and to prepare for the crises that we need to be ready for in the 2020s. Tanya, back to you. Thank you so much, Paul, for that. Um, and just want to thank you again for being that critical friend that we need at the CHS and for your work on this. It's been a fantastic process to work with you on. What do we take away from what Paul has said? Um, I think we'll all have our different reflections on it, which we'll talk about over the next couple of days. For me, I think there's a cautious optimism a drive that we are on the brink of needing to do more and better, and this cautionary tale of just how much further we have to go. So this gives an overview of where we're at in 2020, and now we need to look ahead of what the future will bring. And soon you're gonna hear from some much more eloquent voices than myself on this. But firstly, just um, indulge me a little more while I say a few words on what I think the future holds for the Alliance um, in terms of the CHS. We are at this sort of brink, I think 100 organizations and the effort that they've made to measuring and improving themselves is a good start. And it's one that we've built a momentum that we need to keep pushing forward from. But it's not the critical mass that we need. We need every NGO, donor, UN agency to apply and recognize the CHS to create that concert of real and urgent change that Paul just outlined. And then there's an important point that Paul has picked up and credit thank you to the reviewers as well. And, and thank you to some of you that I know on the line who we've had this conversation for this issue between organizations measuring themselves. It's critical that organizations measure against the standard that the sector set it itself. But let's put ourselves in the shoes of the people who are actually receiving our support and what they care about. And I think Manu said this initially at the beginning, what they really care about is the safety and protection of their, their loved ones, regardless of who is delivering that aid. And what we've got to do better is look at what that collective application is of the CHS at where it matters most in humanitarian operations. So we need at one stage organizations to commit and then we've got to take that collective analysis down to where it matters. So what will that take? What does that mean for the Alliance? Well, I think going back to Sharma who opened this CHS exchange, our vice chair, as she said, we need to understand this is a universal standard, but we need to understand how and why we can get more local and national NGOs to be verifying against it. We need to understand what the drivers for that could be. And as you heard from Robert Sweatman at the beginning, that's about some of the international actors doing far more to recognize the CHS verification. We know that CHS verification could level some of the power imbalances if we all hold ourselves to account around one universal standard. And then the reality when we're talking about power is the effect that the donors have. 
You heard earlier from Miele with the Danish government who've taken a very strong approach in terms of recognizing CHS verification uh, with their partners. And we need more donors to come on board and be able to recognize uh, the commitment to the CHS. And I'd encourage all of you, I know many of you, I can see it from the chat, are really keen to continue that discussion. And please join us on Thursday morning where we're going to be going into more depth around what localization of the CHS means and the donor recognition. And finally, as we start to look ahead to the future, the world isn't the same as it was in 2014, neither should it be or could it be. Uh, but we need to make sure the CHS is fit for the future, which is the question that I've been prompting Kat Skihan to share with ourselves. In this regard, on Thursday, we join together with the other two copyright holders, Group URD and Sphere, where we start to do an initial brainstorming to ask those questions about what would a future CHS need to have in place to be able to meet that accountability to affected people that we need. So please do join us Thursday afternoon and, and share your views with us. But that's enough from me. You'll hear more from us over the next two days, but now really pleased to welcome the next set of panelists who are going to give us some more views of what the future should hold. Thanks, Paul. And Paul. Thank you very much, Paul. And thank you, Tanya. And I see many people have been writing in some comments and some questions uh, about that discussion. And as Tanya has said, there's going to be a full session on that on Thursday. So do make sure that you come to that where you'll be able to join in. You, someone's mentioned that you can't see all the chat. That's because chat's happening in two places and you may not be able to see both of them. One of the places is the Zoom chat, which is where the question is asked. There's also chat going on in the agenda in the session chat. So we're picking up both and those questions are going to be aggregated and ported across for Thursday's session as well. And as we've heard, we're now going to find out a bit more about what the future of innovative accountable aid could look like. So we're going to have three panelists to talk on that. That's Salama Bakala from Loop, Arby Bagayas from Aid Reimagined, and Nan Buzard from the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC. So should we have them up on the screen with us? There we go. Fantastic. Good afternoon to you all. If it's afternoon where you are, it is here. Um, in the order that I mentioned you there, so Salama, starting with you, what do you think the future of innovative accountable aid could look like? Um, that's a big question to answer in 20 minutes. <laughs> but uh, let's, uh, let's try. Um, just uh, just as a start, I would like to talk about feedback, basically, and, and building on the previous um, presentations as well. Um, people within the affected communities have their own ways of uh, providing feedback. It could be a group of women, women having a chat while going to fetch water from somewhere. It could be chats that, that are happening maybe on the background of weddings or, or any other local gathering. So that is already happening. What is missing is that as a sector, we're not thinking into, into that way and we're not using that familiar way that the communities are um, already using. And if you think about the current, the, the current crisis um, around the world, if, if, you, if you think about Syria, Sudan, Yemen or, or, or any other, you, you will notice that one person could be receiving aid from multiple agencies, that one person can be getting protection from one, wash from another, education uh, from another. And as a sector, we're still expecting that one person to be able to um, uh, adapt into all our, our different ways of uh, provision of aid. And in, in this case, so, um, the provision of feedback, sorry. And in this case, the provision of feedback by itself um, becomes a burden. Um, in, in talking about solutions or what the future could hold, um, I would like to talk about Loop, which is um, a new global digital platform where we, like, we don't claim to have all the answers, but then we are also saying that we want to build that answer with the help of the affected communities, the donors and um, uh, providers of aid. And, and Loop, we see it as which could be like one small part of a massive uh, puzzle when it comes to that solution. Um, 
um, within the Loop platform, like the, um, anyone would be able to initiate feedback, to provide feedback, either they're asked to or not, and to provide feedback based on the things that they find important. So it is driven by this, the affected communities and what they want to um, provide feedback on. It's also a simple platform which, which uses a 2G technology. So it can have multiple input mechanisms that could be a WhatsApp, a Facebook, even an interactive voice uh, technology or an SMS, making it again fit the technologies of whatever is available within the communities that we want to target. And, and that's what we would like to see more in the future, us adapting into what people can actually do and, and making it easier for the people uh, providing that feedback. Um, also, um, Loop is a free platform and it will be translated not, not only into local languages, but also into uh, taking into account the local cultural context as well. Uh, but then uh, not to forget that also um, a key principle is uh, do no harm. And, and that's not only towards the affected communities, but also towards the agencies that are working on the ground. And, and that's why aid, like that feedback would be provided through a moderator system where if that feedback can actually cause harm, then that is dealt with outside of the open platform. And um, the idea behind it is to make sure that either you are invited to that top, top secret feedback meeting or not, you can still see what people are saying and, and, and you can still have the freedom of using that data, not only to analyze, but also to even understand what's happening around your own uh, community. Um, and also like Lupus is currently also considering looking into using anonymous reporting to, to address things like safeguarding within the sector, which is again, another big topic that, that needs um, to be addressed. Um, now, I, as we speak within the sector, like who chooses to collect feedback, who decides what kind of feedback is collected or who gets to analyze it, or who chooses to share what on what report? The answer to all of these questions is either the agency providing the aid or the donor. And what we're trying to do is just simply, if we want a different future for the sector, we need to shift that narrative and make sure that, the, that people who are affected by the crisis are in the core of that. And we don't pick and choose what to tell them and when to tell them what. And we actually, they are part of of this process. And um, just, um, um, I would like to also just mention that as a sector or, me, or even as an industry, like we were the only sector where we are the people who are assessing the needs, delivering on the needs, um, um, monitoring on ourselves regarding the needs and reporting on our needs. That doesn't happen in any other sector. It doesn't happen in any other industry, actually not only in a sector. And I think, for us to have a different future, the question that we need to ask ourselves really and truly, is that what accountability look like? Are we redefining accountability to fit the sector? And we honestly need to answer that question. Um, and just to conclude, I would like to go to something that was said to me during a visit to an IDP camp in Yemen. And I was talking to this woman about her perception of aid, and I still can't forget what she said. She simply said, they are treating us like we are ignorant. I know what is best for me. Why don't you all just listen? There, simply put and easily put is what we need to do in order to have a better future and a different future when it comes to this sector. Thank you, Salama. I saw Arby nodding in some agreement there. Um, Arby, your views of the future with respect to, to feedback or indeed any other aspects? Hi everyone, thank you very much for having me here and thank you so much Salama for that, um, you know, like really powerful message. Um, I want to focus on two findings of the humanitarian accountability report, which I think uh, is, is really interesting. Um, the first one is, um, you know, we saw that the report says that uh, the aid sector uh, as a whole is better in writing down policies than acting upon on it. And um, you know, I think that's that's really interesting. It see it it shows that we're we're good at sort of like putting down stuff, but not really uh, doing it and following it, following up on it. And then the second problem is that um, we score the highest in core humanitarian 
commitment number six, which is coordination and complementarity, but we score the lowest in CHS commitment number five, which is um, talking to uh, people uh, and communities uh, that we serve. Um, and I think that there's an underlying theme that connects these two. Um, and I think this is because of our, you know, outdated and to be frank, neo-colonial ways in which we do aid. Um, in the first problem, we're good at putting um, things in paper, but not acting on it. We're good at consulting experts and formulating perfect policies that it oftentimes don't necessarily match the, the, the realities um, and the context on the ground. And I've seen this in, in organizations where, um, yeah, uh, you know, what they're doing is uh, can be classified as isomorphic mimicry, right? Um, this is a term in public policy where um, uh, you just uh, copy and paste a best practice policy, even though it doesn't match um, what uh, the, the, the local context. And in the second problem, um, you know, we're good at talking amongst ourselves. Um, we're good at talking at people who sound and look like us, who are other NGOs. We've become the sort of gated community equivalent um, in this NGO sector. Um, I mean, like, you know, this is a great sort of like platform for everyone to talk about how to improve our sector. But sometimes I wish that we could also have um, members and representatives of um, communities who receive aid in this kinds of events, because then we can just hear from them directly. I'm sure they have a lot to say about uh, us and about the core humanitarian standards. Um, and in fact, Salama and I uh, and Nan, we talked about this um, prior to this event and Salama highlighted that, um, uh, you know, it, we're good at coordination and complementarity because there's investment in it. In fact, there's the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance. What could it look like if there's a similar investment in listening and talking and engaging to people? How come there's no United Nations Office for Accountability of Humanitarian Assistance? Um, and, you know, I think the underlying problem really is, is yeah, an outdated and new colonial sort of like way of implementing um, aid. Um, and so what's the future? What can we do? Um, I think, you know, technologies and ways of working are really important and, you know, are, are really useful in, in addressing this, um, uh, these problems. But I think the first step uh, is to, to change our minds and to change our our mental and institutional models of, of the way we work um, and start really unlearning, uh, unlearning, uh, yeah, like the, the outdated mentalities that we still, you know, consciously or unconsciously um, carry in this line of work. Um, so in the first problem, for example, about sort of like written, uh, written policies, but not implementing them, I am inspired by uh, the work uh, of an Australian indigenous scholar, Tyson Yunkaporta, and he wrote this amazing book, the best book that I've read uh, this year, and it's called Sand Talk. And he contrasts, he makes a contrast between uh, written culture, which is stemming largely from the global North and Western societies versus oral culture, uh, which is um, a, a lot of indigenous communities are more oral based. Um, and I think, you know, there is something to, to, to learn here. Why do we put sort of like emphasis and value on, on what's written or what can be documented and how can we make space and how can we change our system to, to similarly value, um, you know, intangible relationships on the ground. And I've seen this in an organization that I'm involved with where, uh, you know, their score in the CHS um, commitment number five is uh, really low because um, there's no documentary evidence of, of their engagement with local communities, but actually in practice, um, their engagement with local communities is quite strong because a lot of their staff are, are local staff who are part of the communities, but they just couldn't prove it because they don't have, uh, I don't know, like written policy or written evidence. Um, and in the second problem um, of us only talking to ourselves, um, and I really like that Salama highlighted that, you know, we're the only industry that, you know, assesses the needs and then assesses, assess ourselves and measure ourselves. And that's really, really true. I think that it, it is, you know, as much as I appreciate CHS and our sort of like collective effort in, in trying to be better at delivering aid, we can't expect systemic change just from ourselves. Uh, what we need is 
to be held accountable um, uh, by the, the people and communities um, that we serve. And, uh, you know, how can we do this? For me, I think I take inspiration from, you know, trade unions, for example, how come there is, uh, you know, what would it look like or what would be the effect if there's a union of aid recip recipients around the world? And before we, you know, operate in a particular community or particular location, we have to sort of like um, make commitments um, uh, with, the, with unions of, of um, aid recipients. Um, uh, another thing is um, citizens assemblies. Um, this is an idea that is uh, already becoming um, popular in climate justice um, movements of, of citizens assemblies that think can hold their, their governments into account. Um, you know, at the moment uh, with the aid sector, we're, we answer to a lot of donors and to the UN, but what about representatives of communities and the people that we serve? And uh, citizen assemblies are not, you know, kind of like a Northern concept. In fact, in the world's oldest democracy in India, the, uh, uh, sort of like village, um, sort of like committees are are instrumental in 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 holding uh, into account uh, uh, their, their governments, and this is in a, a fascinating book called Oral Democracy by um, the Agenda Rao. Um, and yeah, I think you know, I think these uh, these are the kind of things we need to be thinking about in terms of the future of uh, of, of accountable aid. And I think my final message would be that um, you know, if we are to truly be more accountable, we have to unlearn outdated colonial mental models uh, and truly reimagine the way we do it because uh, we, we cannot expect ourselves to correct ourselves. We, we have to uh, look and listen really to, to people and communities that we serve. Thank you. Thanks, Abi. And uh, Nan, you were also smiling and nodding as that was happening. What, what are your thoughts on the future that you'd like to add? Uh, thanks. Well, I was smiling because um, I had the great pleasure of uh, speaking briefly with Salama and RV a few days ago when we were just kind of thinking together about this. And I was so struck by not only their passion and their youth, um, but their really concrete suggestions and really, really um, kind of highly informed insight. So I, I was just smiling at that because I love it because that is the future um, of humanitarian action. So it's it's great to see. Um, really happy to be here. Um, I really want to also just say a, a thanks to, to Paul's points on change because I think and I think you know this actually echoes for RB and Slama also, which is we've got to understand kind of how change happens and how we see change. And I think this mental model piece is, is quite important. So um, I'll try to go fast. I'm taking a bit of a different tack, which my um, fellow panelists know, because I had mentioned this, which is more about kind of having a think about the future in general. So my work at the ICRC is a lot about thinking about the futures of many things. So it can be future of healthcare, future of communications, future of logistics. I mean, we're really across many different things. Um, that we do with, with many of our colleagues at ICRC, obviously the future of certain technologies. Um, my real kind of takeaway from my, my last few years at the ICRC is this incredible importance to ceaselessly, meaning constantly, be looking at the world around us. We all get very narrow, whether it's in our subject area or even in our community, and the ability to constantly be paying attention to a very wide world and the things that are happening in it are so critical. We do not work in a bubble. Um, we may act like we work in a bubble, um, but it is a very big and super interconnected world. So I just, I, that's a really strong thing. So I was gonna just tell you a little bit about this past summer, the innovation teams at UNHCR, ICRC and MSF came together because we were all very interested in futures and foresight. It's an innovation methodology where you really try to pay attention to the future. Um, and we did a, an approach called Signals where we worked across all three of our organizations to hear from lots of different levels in the organization about what people thought was going to happen kind of in a post COVID. I mean, that was really our trigger, but it was really about trying to say, 
what is a new normal? I know we don't like that expression, but I think it's important to, to bring it up. And we wanted to see if we could um, kind of develop some collective intelligence. And I think Tanya, you said something about collective application. And, and I think we're in that same stream of kind of what would be a collective intelligence where we bring our thinking together. So in short, we um, got a lot of what we call signals. What were people hearing? What were people reading? Um, from all and the more diverse signals you have, the better. And then we tried to make sense of them. So I just wanted to share with you kind of two big ones. And I think they both can be relevant to the common humanitarian standards. And also maybe we can come back to the three blockages that, that Paul noted, because I think there could be potentially a link. Um, so one big signal, no surprise, um, I think to anyone is the that we that the amplification of inclusion and localization is more and more powerful so nothing new this has been happening for decades and at the same time i think i hope i believe it is bigger than it's ever been um coronavirus has obviously been a huge accelerator um, in literally changing who can be where um who is taking the leadership who is taking the decisions um and at the same time, coronavirus is happening in a time when traditional approaches are being deeply questioned. So it's an interesting juxtaposition. Um, there were signals of flattening hierarchies going forward, changing mental models. So thank you, RB, for saying that. Um, and very a very kind of strong beat of leadership and decision making much closer to where the action happens and farther away from wherever that capital might be. So, um, I think that was powerful, not surprising, but it was powerful. Um, a second signal, and again, not surprising, but I, I think it's so important to everyone to listen to this part, which is around the digital maelstrom, we called it. Um, so everyone knows there's an explosion. I mean, here we are online. And do you know, from a neurological point of view, that part of the reason you're tired after an end of the day of being on Zoom or Skype or Teams is that our brains and our eyes were not made for two-dimensional. We were made for three-dimensional. We were made to being seen with each other. And because we can't, at the end of the day, we're so tired because our brains are worrying behind us, we're looking, looking, trying to make sense of this. But that's just a little thing about um, understanding how our brains work. Because this technology that we are really in the world of um, is changing everything, how we educate, how we work, how we shop, how we communicate, it's changing humanitarian agencies' actions. Um, it's accelerating a lot of stuff. And a lot of that is very positive and powerful. I think very positively, it could bring much greater um, transparency, which is maybe one key to accountability and not just about who's reporting on who or who's checking on who, but transparency that isn't um, contaminated by anyone's bias wherever they sit. I think that's an interesting piece. But I also want to say that, that these new technologies um, and this just kind of rapid advancement in science um, also brings new dangers. There are going to be new vulnerabilities. It may not be the same people that have been vulnerable, or those same people might be additionally vulnerable, but there could be new vulnerabilities. It could be from cybersecurity, from human beings being hacked. I mean, I, I know this sounds like kind of outer space, but we have to take into account um, that these, these kind of new um, technologies are advancing so fast, geoengineering, um, advanced AI are gonna have profound effects. So I just, I wanna say that because I think the next wave of globalization, which will continue to happen, and it's gonna be powered by digitalization is going to disrupt things that we don't even know are gonna be disrupted, whether it's how we work, how we communicate, and there could be massive knock-on effects. So I think we really, my big point is, we have to be thinking about things that we're not thinking about. We have to be aware. So it's not just the future of aid, it's the future. And then it's about how accountabilities are played out in that. I have a lot more to say, but I know that our time is short. So um, I just, I guess my real thing is that we're gonna have legal and ethical and governance questions that need to be anticipated. For example, the ICRC, we work a lot in detention. What if people are detained in space? You know, it sounds like a fantasy, but it isn't. You know, these are real things that we're going to have to grapple with. You know, where is international humanitarian law applicable? I mean, we just all have to think about these things. So 
Um, I guess I would say for the for the common humanitarian standard, as you look to the future, I would think a lot about listening to grassroots media. I think this is really in social media. I mean, I think there's signals that you'll be able to pick up that could be very powerful. Combine it with anticipating these changes in technologies um, and see maybe the CHS evolution through lenses like that and not just assume that it stays constant, but that there are evolutions. Um, and maybe these three areas of blockage that Paul identified about participation, information management, and organizational flexibility could also be looked a, a bit in a futures orientation to even better prepare and advance them and accelerate them. Um, thanks again for, for having me join you. Thank you so much, Nan and Salama and Arby. You're getting fantastic comments in the two sets of chat, the one on the platform and the one on Zoom. So I recommend you have a look at those and that you join us and others in the continuing discussion 